tonight's lectures are Rick Gefkin, a fantastic author and historian, and also um, a friend of mine, and Rob Shomo and Joelle Zabaka, who are doing great things with the Cedar View Cemetery. So without further ado, the Friends of Cedar View Cemetery. So thank you, Dana. And let me see if I can share my screen, which I hope you have up for me. And we'll get there in one second, folks, I promise. And there you go, I can see start, it. Start at the beginning, which is always a good thing to do. So uh, good evening to everybody. And as Dana just uh, mentioned, I've got two of my friends and colleagues, uh, Joel Zabatka from Monmouth University and Rob Chameau from um, formerly of Monmouth County, but he lives a little bit out of, out of town now. Uh, but as you'll see, as we talk to you tonight, uh, every one uh, of, of the three of us are part of the Board of Trustees for the Cedar View Cemetery. Uh, and I'm particularly pleased uh, what's happened with this group for a couple of reasons. As you all know, we've got a tremendous amount of history, and I should say prehistory here in the Monmouth County area. Um, but uh, lately, in the last several years that I'm aware of, at least, a lot of what has not been uh, so widely known has come to the fore. And this cemetery, as you'll find out tonight, uh, is uh, part of the Black heritage of uh, Monmouth County. And there's so much richness here, not only in the cemetery, but the folks whose lives um, were lived in Monmouth County and then their souls were interred here. So I think you're going to find out uh, quite quite a lot. So uh, as you can see from the screen, um, that's more or less what the cemetery looks like today. Um, there may be a few more leaves on the ground uh, than when this picture was taken. But to give you a, a sense of orientation, it is just a bit north, a couple of yards north of St. Leo the Great School in uh, Lincroft, along Hurley Lane there in that little picture. So if you go from Newman Springs Road up Hurley Lane, uh, right after you pass the uh, Stations of the Cross there at the end of the St. Leo property, you will see uh, a marker for Cedar View Cemetery. In fact, that's the marker you'll see that we were so pleased uh, that the uh, people in Middletown government helped us with. Um, this is a picture taking, taken on uh, our uh, dedication ceremony on Memorial Day this year. And all the folks um, in this picture have relatives uh, in, as you'll find out, in Cedarview Cemetery. And there's Rob uh, up against a tree back there in the background with his uh, brothers and sister and our uh, current uh, president of Cedar, Friends of Cedarview, John Smack, uh, second from the right. So that's where we are uh, physically. So I want to give you a lot of background, I hope. So I think probably almost everyone on this call will recognize the name Leedsville, the former name of uh, Lincroft. And to give you some orientation uh, on this map, which is from 1861, Red Bank, of course, is on the right. This is Newman Springs Road and leading into the Five Corners area of Leedsville. And just so you remember a little bit about where this is, the former uh, Lincroft Inn, no longer extant, unfortunately, sat there for many years. Um, it started out as a Leedsville Hotel way back when. And the cemetery is uh, right about there on uh, a, a piece of geography that didn't even have a road back when this map was done. Um, so that's where we will talk about what's going on here tonight. <laughs> Now, I have to pay reverence and thanks to our late friend, May Edwards, without whom a lot of what I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, I wouldn't know. And certainly her family, some of whom I think will be on tonight's call as well, um, shared an awful lot of their family history. May Edwards, uh, for those who didn't know her, uh, was a lifetime uh, Middletown resident, particularly in Lincroft in her early part of her life. She was a surgical nurse at Riverview Hospital for a career. Uh, her husband ran a business in Middletown. Her children went through the Middletown school systems. And May 
to my delight when I met her, kind of like in the last year of her life, shared with me an enormous uh, amount of her family's heritage, which I've been always grateful for, because it revealed to me what I never knew, that there are Black families everywhere who know a lot about their, their own genealogy and history, uh, whereas I thought that all that had been lost. So we're going to talk about some of some of that history tonight. And again, I want to thank uh, the uh, the Edwards family, her descendants, uh, for all of the uh, sharing of pictures and stories and everything else they've done. And several of them are also, I should mention, on our boards at the Friend of Cedarview. So let's talk about that family. And it begins, uh, and May was kind enough to share this with me, with her great grandfather, a man named Charles Reeves, who the family believes was enslaved. We'll talk about that. Um, and as a matter of fact, was enslaved to the Williamson family who lived in that house up on uh, Newman Springs Road in what is today's Homedale, but was then part of Middletown. Uh, somewhere in the early part of his life, he met this woman with uh, one of their sons, I believe, Hannah Van Cleef, who was somewhat younger than him. Uh, they became a life lifelong marriage uh, couple, uh, had 11 children. Uh, we're going to talk about them as well. Now, this is not proven yet, but we're trying to find out. The Taylor Butler House, as you know, in Middletown that the Monmouth County Historic Association manages, uh, has records of a woman named Elizabeth Van Cleef who worked there as a servant. And although the name uh, is spelled just a little bit differently, which was not uncommon in those days, I've been searching high and low to see if there's any relationship between Hannah and Elizabeth, which I can't definitively pin down, but I have a suspicion uh, that she may be either her daughter or her younger sister to be determined. And when Elizabeth Van Cleef was alive and working for the Taylor family, she was in that house for most of her life as well. And the Monmouth County Historic Association's website has an awful lot about her uh, at their exhibits uh, also um, in Middletown. Now, both of those houses that these folks uh, are associated with are still extant. Charles Reeves, uh, the Williamson house, is almost, uh, well, it is actually in Homedale now, and up until very recently looked identical to that early picture that I showed you, that drawing. Unfortunately, at least for me, um, as a uh, person interested in history, that house at 133 Newman Springs Road is now painted white, and the new owners have added a garage to it, so it doesn't quite look like the picture I took. The Taylor Butler house has been remarkably preserved, as you, don't, as you know, I'm sure, by the Monmouth County Historic Association and looks quite similar to, way, to the way it did in that earlier image. And to give you an idea about Charles and Hannah, um, after they married in 1850, they lived quite differently from what their origins were. In fact, they lived on Middletown Lincroft Road in this house, as did the four generations of Reeves to follow them. Now, Charles Reeves is essential to this story, and as you've already guessed, I hope, he is interred, as is Hannah, in the Cedarview Cemetery. But here's another view, an 1851 map of our area, and again, for orientation purposes, Newman Springs Road is here on the lower right, coming out of Red Bank, of course, and this road north-south mostly is Middle, uh, Middle Town Lincroft Road. So let me bring you through Charles' life a little bit, and of course it includes his wife. So he was born, you can even see on the map, D. Williamson, uh, in 1823 on what was then a pretty substantial couple hundred acre farm in Middletown, belonged to David Williamson. And in spite of how the name sounds, almost English, they're actually Dutch uh, because it's a uh, anglicized version of Williamsay which is the diminutive for uh, how Dutch families uh, name the sons. So David Williamson came from a Dutch family, very, very common in the uh, 17th and 18th century Monmouth County areas. 
So Charles started his life there, worked for many years there. Uh, and at one point we know about 1850, he wound up working for Garrett Hendrickson, another famous uh, Monmouth County name. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, David Williamson was married to a cousin of Garrett Hendrickson. And you may or may not know this, but uh, slaves and uh, even um, manumitted slaves were frequently rented out to other folks uh, back in, in those times. And so I believe there's a connection between how uh, Charles Reeves wound up working for Garrett Hendrickson. And by the way, he may not have worked at this specific location because the Hendricksons, as you can see here and here, had property all over. There's some more Hendricksons up here in what is now Homeda. Uh, in 1850, and we'll tell you why, Charles and Hannah married at was uh, the, the, then in Middletown again, but called the Homedale Baptist Church, still extant uh, down the road um, when Newman Springs Road becomes Main Street in Homedale, right about here. Um, soon after they were married, uh, Charles wound up working at what was then called the Brookdale Farm, down in that part of our geography, probably for the better part of a decade. And then something remarkable happened that changed a lot of lives in this story. Um, John B. Crawford of the famous Crawford family um, had probably hired uh, Charles at one point and liked him so much that he moved a house that was formerly on the property of today's uh, Christian Brothers Academy to Middletown Link Croft Road right about here. And that was the home that Charles and Hannah raised their family in. And uh, as I mentioned, the family stayed there for the next uh, four generations. So that home that you saw, uh, literally just a shack in the early days, was moved across probably on logs, the field over here, and it became the one acre property of uh, the uh, Reeves family. And when I say became their property, it wasn't actually until 1900 uh, when they were granted the deed to the property. So it looked like kind of a tenant farm situation where in exchange for working, Charles and his wife were allowed to live in this house on this property in uh, what was then Leedsville. Um, we do know that as their family grew, uh, there are stories, both local stories and family stories, where every Sunday, the Rees family would at first work, uh, walk, I should say, and then later on when they could afford a horse and carriage, drive down into what was the original, not the same one today, the original Pilgrim Baptist Church in Red Bank. A lot of you may know it as a Russian Orthodox Church now. Uh, this was the predecessor of what is Pilgrim Baptist now on uh, Shrewsbury Avenue. And then finally, when Charles passed away in 1900, uh, he was uh, waked, if you will, and celebrated out of what was then the Lincroft Baptist Church here, and then interred in the Cedarview Cemetery that we're gonna get into some detail about. And what I discovered as I put this little part of this slide together was how central and important the Baptist faith were, was to these people, as you can see. Uh, they were married in it, in the uh, uh, Baptist church. They worshiped at another Baptist church. And of course, this was considered a chapel in um, uh, Lincroft and many, many of the burials uh, and the celebrations before they uh, folks were interred uh, were celebrated out of that chapel. Some of you may even recognize that building today uh, in the little uh, strip mall in, uh, in Lincroft. But it shows you the tenacity uh, and the faith of these people that all through their lives, they remain true to what they believed. Now, the families also shared with me a copy of their marriage certificate, which happened uh, April 7th, 1850, as you see. Uh, hard to read here, but it does say uh, Charles Reeves of Middletown and Hannah Van Cleef of Middletown were married in Homedale at that Baptist church. And that's kind of what it may have looked like back in those days. Uh, it doesn't look too much different today. I think this outbuilding has been decorated a little bit differently, but if you're up there, it's on the south side of Main Street in Homedale, you may have, you may have passed it quite a lot. 
And one of the reasons that I believe that they married uh, in 1850 has a lot to do with our history in New Jersey of the abolition of enslavement. Um, it turns out that after the better part of 150 years of people owning slaves, that by 1804, the tenor of the times was changing and our state legislature passed what was called an act for the gradual abolition of slavery, gradual being the operative word. And that act stipulated that children born to enslaved women after July 4th that year were free, uh, except female children had to serve 21 more years for the master of their mother and males until 25. So based on what we know about Charles and Hannah's birth dates, it looks like um, they were both manumitted around uh, 1849 or 1850 under the law. And it would make sense that they would then begin to get married officially in a uh, holy matrimony ceremony um, and therefore start their lives together. Now, the burying ground that we're going to talk about has its very unique history, as you would expect. And this deed, which I know is hard to read, uh, is from John B. Crawford to a fellow named Alexander Frost, and turns out 14 free Black men. And that deed is November of 1850, and it's two acres. Of course, these meant $60. Uh, they were all Black men. And so John B. and Catherine Crawford granted this property to them. And the question is, why would they do that? Well, let's talk about the property first. This is a contemporaneous map of uh, Cedarview Cemetery facing north as it should. Over here would be today's Hurley Lane, and down here would be the St. Leo the Great property. And when these men bought this, um, Alexander Frost, who seemed to have led the group, divided this up into 24 plots of about 99 feet by 33 feet, pretty substantial plots. Um, and this plot here in the far southwest corner, southeast corner, I should say, of the cemetery was purchased from Alexander Frost by Charles Reeves about 20 years after the cemetery was established. And we believe at that point that Charles, of course, as a working man, a, a free man for a lot of years, had accumulated enough money, $10 doesn't seem like a lot, but it certainly was then, to buy this property for the folks in his family who were starting to age and who would, as you'll find out in a second, be interred at that plot. And it turns out that the plot looks something like that today. And that the Reeves family, of all the souls, and Rob will get into some more detail about this uh, later, of all the souls that are interred in the cemetery, the Reeves family, this branch of this Reeves family, have more people buried there than any other family that we know of. In fact, these two stones, which are more modern, and we believe were purchased later after both Charles and Hannah passed away by one of their sons, um, uh, are right there at the front edge, right about here under that 12, let's say, uh, in that image. And it turns out these, as I mentioned, were May Edward's great-grandparents. And as you'll find out when Joel talks about uh, her involvement with this, without May Edward's, uh, what we're talking about tonight, and in fact, the restoration of the cemetery would probably not have happened. Um, and as time went on, uh, there are at least 13 Reeves family interments there, including a large number of their children. As I mentioned, they had 11 children. Some of them moved away, of course, uh, but at least these folks are interred there and a few others as well. And these are the ones that the family has shared pictures with, uh, uh, with me for. So the question becomes, why would the Crawfords get involved in, in uh, these folks' lives? And, you know, were they slaveholders? So, of course, the Monmouth County Archives is a valuable resource for us to find out information. And lo and behold, in an 1825 deed, we have John B. Crawford of the Township of Middletown brings before the county clerk in Freehold 
his slave named Robin White, who, and that's the original spelling in the document, is a man of color, about 36 years of age, and he's manumitted and set free. Now, why is that? Well, it has to do with that 1804 Act for the Gradual Abolition of Slavery, I thought. But actually, it didn't for this reason. If he was born 36 years before this document, that would have made Robin White's birth date somewhere in 1789 or so. This was before the state of New Jersey passed that law. So he was undoubtedly born enslaved and spent many years because he would not have been eligible for automatic manumission under the 1804 law. But John B. Crawford decided to manumit this man anyway. Now, we don't have any documentation to prove why he did that, but at the very least, we can imagine that John B. Crawford saw what was going on. Many formerly enslaved people were being manumitted uh, under the law, and I assume that this man, Robin White, had served him well, and he took it upon himself to uh, manumit him uh, in 1825. We've got another document from 1839 where John Crawford and Catherine, okay, sell to Alexander Frost, and in this deed it says colored man of the same place, meaning Middletown, a hundred dollar parcel. This is not the cemetery part. This is a home that Alexander and his wife undoubtedly lived on. Now, what's interesting about this 1839 deed is that we know Alexander Frost was born in 1814. And although I have not seen yet any documents that he was an enslaved man, if he was, and under the 1804 law, he would have been eligible for manumission in 1839. So I believe there's a link here. And I think he knew John Crawford, perhaps had worked for him at one point. And as a free black man, approached John Crawford and bought property for him and his wife and started his family uh, in 1839. So what we all have here is a record of John B. Crawford, at least, being very tuned into what's going on in the country and in Monmouth County in those days um, and doing some very interesting things for his black neighbors. Now, um, when I looked at the 1840 census, I wanted to find out uh, more about John B. Crawford. And way down the bottom of that page, you could see Crawford's um, John and Catherine had quite a big family. And in those days, the census records have a column for free whites, free colored, and then slaves. And sure enough, by 1840, in the John B. Crawford family, they have two uh, what were called free colored people working for them, uh, a young man and two women, and they're showing no slaves. So at the very least, we can talk about the Crawfords as being on the edge of thinking about equality um, and the uh, awful practice of uh, slavery that had been in this country and in our state and county for quite a long time. So why would uh, the Crawford sell to Alexander Frost and his other men a black cemetery in 1850. Well, we don't know specifically from primary documents, but we have pretty good evidence. Um, this is, of, of course, inscribed on the on the plaque uh, that we put up this year. But I think it has to do with what happened just a few months before when our federal government passed what was called the Fugitive Slave Law. And the background of that is that many, many slaves that you would expect all over, but particularly from the southern plantations, that brutal economic system, were running away, trying to get north, trying to get upstate Canada uh, or anywhere they could where they would be free. And so the federal government uh, urged uh, on by the legislators representing the southern states passed what was called the Fugitive Slave Act. And this act, horrendously enough, puts the federal government in 1850 on the side of slaveholders because it says any slaveholder can legally demand a return of anybody held to service or labor in any state in the United States, a.k.a. any enslaved person. 
There were penalties for citizens who help escape slaves that played out everywhere in the North, especially in New Jersey. And slave catchers were hired by these Southern plantation owners and financially incented to come up here and bring back their escaped, what they thought of as property. And unfortunately, these men did not have, most of them were men, these slave catchers, the scruples that you might want. And so what began to happen was that they would come north and any unsuspecting or uh, unwitting black person that they could capture uh, and return south uh, where they could claim that this person was an escaped slave, they would be rewarded from. So again, since the cemetery property was sold by the Crawfords to these 14 men in November 1850, it looks to me like John Crawford and his wife Catherine were very aware of this law that had been passed and it's very possible that they and these men knew that by having a property deed, because we're not sure how many of the others besides Alexander Frost owned property, they would have one more hedge against being uh, called runaway slaves. Slaves were not allowed to own property. So if they had property like cemetery property, they would have had to be free people. So we think that's the uh, correlation there. So I'm now gonna turn the uh, next part of the presentation over to Rob. And Rob, I will advance the slides uh, as you would like. Okay, thank you, Rick. For those that are, you can see the slide, uh, that is a picture of uh, me and my brother, Keith, at the headstone of Silas Reeves, who is our second great grand uncle. Uh, it's one of the few headstones that is uh, quite legible. Uh, for me, I first learned about Cedar View Cemetery in late 2012. I was doing a research paper for my father on his family and came across my second great grandfather's obituary and it stated that he was buried in Leedsville. Well, at that time, I didn't know what Leedsville was. Um, and then when I discovered that Leedsville was really Lincroft, I asked my father about it. Uh, and he basically didn't know that he, a cemetery in, in Lincroft. He knew he had relatives in Middletown, but he never associated Lincroft with Middletown. So uh, the interesting point there is that we lived at that time uh, less than three miles away from the cemetery and pretty much you know, went to high school there and everything. And we never heard, anybody in our family never heard about a cemetery in Lincroft. Well, the good news is, is that some of the byproducts of this research, I found out that my third and fourth great grandparents are also buried at Cedar View. And there's over 20 relatives buried there as well. <laughs> These 14 lot owners were all free colored men. And the first woman bought a lot in 1872. Uh, most of these free colored men were farm laborers. Uh, the exception was a Lloyd Johnson who was a blacksmith. So they all worked extremely hard. Uh, the majority of the farm laborers all lived in Middletown and many of them lived in close proximity to each other and to the Crawford's family. Now we know the Beldos, the Bowles, the Frost, the Reeves, the Holmes, and the Shumos all have deep roots in Monmouth County. And as early as 1830, many of them were already free. Uh, okay. We'll pause here and slides to catch up. One thing I should note, and uh, Rick pointed this out, Alexander Frost was one of the few members of that initial lot owners that was able to read and write. Most of the men could not read and write. So that was probably a plus for him in terms of purchasing land. Okay, that's good. Okay, you can hold it there. Now this slide here, looks like the text is missing up top, uh, but for most of the lot owners, this would be their first piece of property. And we know that land ownership was a very significant metric 
in the twilight of slavery, uh, along with things like freedom, the right to vote, and citizenship, and a quest to be equal. Uh, many of those things would not come until the Emancipation Proclamation and the amendments, 13th, 14th, and the 15th Amendment. But what I tried to capture in this slide is what real estate value existed for some of these lot owners uh, starting in 1850 and working out to 1870. These values came out of the Middletown census records. Uh, and it should be noted that the cemetery lot sale happened after the 1850 census was taken. So these dollar values do not necessarily represent lots that were bought in Cedarview Cemetery. But let's, let's look at the, the list here. In 1850, you see most of the people bought lots and then there were a few that came in later. And finally, William Jacobus was one of the last uh, buyers. Uh, but if you look at the value of the land in 1850 that many of them had, uh, only Elijah Frost had more than a dollar's worth, which is interesting. And then following out in the next year, you see uh, William Jacobus uh, had significant land. And then finally in 1870, uh, both Alexander Frost and uh, William Jacobus had sizable amounts of uh, estate value. But the bottom line is, if you look at the bottom line, uh, John B. Crawford, $60,000 worth of land in 1850. And then in 1860, he had 42,000. And the only reason why it decreased is because he was selling off a lot of his land to his sons at that time. He was either in bad health or knew he wasn't gonna be around much longer. So there's a wide disparity between land ownership in the farm workers versus the farm owners. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Oh, I see what you did. Go past that. Okay. Right around this time, uh, 1862, uh, we had this thing called the Militia Act of 1862 form. And what this enabled President Lincoln to do was to uh, put African Americans in the military. Now, there are a couple of caveats there. There's a fine print there that says they can come into the service, but for the purpose of constructing entrenchments or performing camp service. So they had the menial tasks, not necessarily frontline duty. The other caveat with this particular act is that yes, everybody was paid in, in greenbacks, but there was a discrepancy in the amount paid. In 1863, the blacks were only paid $10 a month and they had to deduct $3 a month for clothing. So effectively, they got $7 a month for being in the military, whereas the white counterpart, $13 a month and an additional $350 for clothing. So there was a lot of lobbying that went on, and President uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, had a lot of discussions with Frederick Douglass as one of the parties, and they eventually resolved it in 1864 all privates would be paid $16 a month. We can go to the next slide. Now, <clears throat> members of the Cedar View community entered the call. And you can see on the left side, there was a huge group of draftees, if you will, in September and December of 1864 that joined the military. There are two sets of brothers, uh, Alfred Frost and Isaac Frost. Those are sons of Alexander Frost. And we had uh, Silas Reeves and Eliza Reeves. They were sons of Eli Silas Reeves Sr. But most of them ended up in the 41st Regiment, which was interesting. Um, and then if you look at the ages, uh, Jacob Wall, 43 years old, the uh, Conscription Act that was in place there in 1863 basically made it, if you were between 20 and 45, you had to sign up for the draft. So the question that immediately came to my mind, if you look at the ages, why were there so many 18 and 19 year olders joining and being drafted? I don't know the answer to that. 
But the other question that pops up is that some of these guys had families, they had wives and at least a couple of kids. How could they afford to take care of their families on $16 a, a month? Uh, obviously, the wife must have had to work. Uh, but the other thing that happened was the um, substitutes were used in some cases. If you look down the third line from the bottom, there's a George F. Smith with an asterisk following his name. Uh, Part of the law allows a person, if they pay $300, to have someone substitute for them during the Civil War. Obviously, they're exempt from the draft. Uh, now, $300, I believe, was the equivalent today of like about $5,000. So basically, it was people who had money to buy their way out of the draft. We can go to the next slide. Okay, so the soldiers went to war. Uh, most of them came back. Uh, unfortunately, there were a couple that never made the return trip. Uh, if you look towards the bottom, there's uh, Private Eliza Reeves and Private Jacob Wall. Uh, they both died in field hospital. And this was not that unusual. More people died in the Civil War from disease than did from battle wounds. But these two guys were actually two of the elder people who joined, and it's unfortunate, but they did not make the return trip. There is an interesting story behind this. Uh, Eliza Reeves had two kids, and uh, what happened was uh, he came back from the war. Uh, well, he, was, he died during the war, but they were able to get reverse pensions or back pay pensions for two kids that were basically not allowed to have the pension initially, but they refiled and were able to get money that they were owed. Because I think back then, up until 16 years old, a, a child was eligible for a pension. Uh, the other thing that happened was uh, John H. Frost, he's about in the middle of the page up there, he uh, was wounded in his leg during the war and actually had to have his leg amputated. Uh, his wife, when John passed, basically was refusing to take his pension. It's an interesting story. It, it's a long story, but she basically had the faith in God would take care of her and she didn't need the pension. We can go to the next slide. This is a timeline of events that happened for Cedar View, uh, the first 50 years of, of Cedar View. And up at the top, you see the, the event about to sale of the lots. Uh, and basically, you can see that one of the last sales in 1879, uh, which is a good uh, almost 30 years from the start of the sale. And then the other thing we needed to point out is what cemeteries were available. There were a number of small church cemeteries available, but obviously, they probably started filling up. Uh, Crystal Screen was, was being founded around the time Cedar View was created, and also Pine Brook. But the main cemetery that most people think of in this area is White Ridge, and that didn't come about until 1886. And we also point out in this timeline, cleanup. Uh, it was a well-advertised cleanup that happened in 1886, led by James Bowles, who was the sexton of the cemetery. And as we move down to the bottom, some key internments happened. Uh, the first internment that we know of was in Ellis Johnson in 1864, and he was the son of Lloyd Johnson. The first veteran to be interred was Alfred Frost in 1872. Another internment that happened, which was pretty significant, was Alexander Frost. Uh, Alexander is buried at Cedar View. We don't know which lot. But an interesting thing about Alexander is he left a will. And in his will, he left his entire estate to Margaret Frost, who was his second wife. And he instructed her that at the time of her death, the estate would be sold and divided amongst his remaining or uh, surviving children. One was Henry Frost, and then there were three daughters, a granddaughter named Roseberry, 
who is also interred at Cedarview, and a stepdaughter named Annie E. Stillwell, who was Margaret's daughter from the first marriage, which was kind of interesting. You can go to the next slide. So what happened in the next 50 years was pretty much very little activity. We know the last Sextons died by 1934. But one of the things I always curious about is when was access denied or blocked for CW Cemetery? Well, we know that there was an internment in 1954, and that's the last one that we knew about. But also, a local American Legion group held the Memorial Day service in May of 1955, decorating the veterans' graves. And then there's a period of uh, time where we don't know much about it, but thanks to Joel and the Monmouth University group, we did start seeing cleanups happening as early as two, 2015. Uh, there may have been others before that, but they were not well documented. And then finally, uh, Friends of Cedarview was incorporated in 2021 uh, with the task of basically preserving and restoring uh, Cedarview cemeteries. Now, what do we know about the interred and why it's important? Um, we know that from find a grave that's been documented that nearly uh, 124 people are interred there. Uh, additional research by looking at death records and additional obituary, that list has grown up to about 220 people. Uh, now, people are curious about what's the capacity of Cedar View. Well, if you look at using a small size grave and putting that overlaying that over each one of the lots you get about a hundred graves per lot so from a capacity perspective cedar view can hold probably over two thousand people now we don't know for sure how many people are interred there but one of our plans uh we'd like to be able to get a, a dpr ground penetrating radar survey done and it might help us understand if there are additional uh, people buried uh, and also uh, where they're buried. Because the perimeter of the cemetery has been marked. But we also know that there are people buried at Cedar View that were not part of the uh, original lot owners' families. Uh, some of them uh, are not African American, uh, some of them are immigrants. Uh, a lot of children. Uh, there are people who died, like in the poor house. There's a place called uh, Wayland Farms in Wayside, where it's called the Poor Farm. And those people are also buried at Cedar View or in a lot adjacent to Cedar View. Uh, but we believe that researching will help the help, <clears throat> excuse me. Research in the interred allows us to restore a piece of forgotten black history of Monmouth County and it provides living descendants with a means to reconnect with their ancestors. Uh, one of the products that I worked on is a paper, uh, Cedar View Internment, that I'm currently working on the third edition and hope to have it out by the end of the year that will basically be a database of a lot of the internments and the families who are uh, buried at Cedar View. I, that's the last slide. Uh, okay, so I'll on. jump in here. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what, um, how we became involved, what our recent efforts have been. I became involved in September of 2015, when St. Leo the Great, the parish next door to the cemetery, noticed uh, two people walking up the hill in the back part of the parish um, where they had cleared for some solar panels. And these two people were walking up into what St. Leo's didn't know what. Um, come to see as they climbed the hill that they saw a gravestone, didn't really know the extent of how large it would be and contacted my husband, who was very involved with the Boy Scouts at that time, thinking that we could get a couple of Boy Scouts to come and clean the cemetery. 
Um, the cemetery was extremely overgrown. And if you can see here, this is one little headstone and you can see the amount of brush and trees that were covering it. So the cemetery itself was extraordinarily overgrown. Um, accessing into the cemetery was difficult. You had to climb into it over felled trees and branches. And it was um, just very, very overgrown, difficult to see. And at the time, we really only saw about 10 or so, 10 to 12 headstones, because the rest of the headstones right now, we know that there are about 54. Um, at that time, it didn't look like that many at all, because they all really looked like this. If you can see this one headstone there. And as we began to clean, we started to discover more and more headstones. Now we know that there were past efforts at cleaning the cemetery. So you heard um, Rick mention May, May Edwards. This is her right here in 1989 um, with her son Edwin and with Will Conrad. So quite a bit ago, these are the same two headstones that were in Rick's pictures. Um, of Charles and Hannah Reeves. So clearly at that point in 1989, it looks more accessible than it did in 2015. And in fact, this is an old newspaper clipping from 1992 discussing a young man's Eagle Scout pro uh, project that was going to be to clean the cemetery. Again, here are the same two headstones a little more difficult to see. Um, and this is Silas Reeves headstone. So there had been some past efforts to clean and restore the cemetery, but basically between 1992, and we don't know how well cleaned it was in 1992, but between 1992 and 2015, nothing really at all had been done. Um, we have now in 20. 15 happens and we start to bring together some groups, contacting different groups around the area to come and help. And really the first two groups that joined forces and really put a tremendous amount of work in were the Boy Scouts, the local Boy Scout troop. This is the Lincroft troop that helped fill seven of these large dumpsters. Um, with trees and brush and the remnants of many an old party. Um, and here are further groups of Boy Scouts and other volunteers, St. Leo the Great Parishioners were instrumental in bringing um, a lot of hours of power, manual labor to just clean the cemetery. Remember that there was really no way in at this point. So you were really just climbing in with your rakes and shovels. Um, and dragging things out and down the hill into the dumpsters. Um, after a short amount of time, we branched out and started to get more and more um, groups of people involved, people who had heard what was going on and started to contact me. We were putting flyers out there to come and help clean. And this is just one picture from, again, we started cleaning the cemetery in October of 2015. This is November of 2015. A large group from Pilgrim Baptist Church in Red Bank came to clean. They would be bringing their own shovels. We would tell them to bring uh, wear work boots because we didn't really know what was back there. We know now there's tons of poison ivy back there. Um, we had some uh, two at this point, Eagle Scout projects, again, bringing Boy Scouts in, Boy Scouts asking, what do we need? And certainly you can see how much better the cemetery was looking by this point. So our two Eagle Scout projects were stairs. And this is the end of the walkway here coming into the cemetery, but a set of stairs um, from Hurley's Lane. Once it was cleared enough, we didn't have to climb over the hill by St. Leo's to get into the cemetery. And our first Boy Scout project for his Eagle project made a set of stairs and a walkway and two benches to help us access the cemetery from Hurley's Lane. 
Um, I'll bring it back to May Edwards again at this point because the reason why the stairs are placed where they are is because as she told us that as a child, this is where she remembered client going into the cemetery. She remembered the entrance being there um, when she would go to visit her deceased family members and to have a picnic on a Sunday afternoon. And so we put the stairs and the walkway where she remembered that they should have been. This is a kiosk that was built by our second Eagle project, which gives us a plot map of the graves that we knew at that point. Um, we've come to, of course, learn further, but this was in 2018. And this one, the walkway and the steps and the uh, benches is 2017. So you'll see us moving along. It did really take a good two years to get to the point where it was clear enough to even put stairs in, put the kiosk in. Okay. So as we moved along, as opposed to bringing community members in, from the local community, we started to bring students from Monmouth University. Um, prior to COVID, Monmouth had what they called the big event. It was every fall and it was a university-wide day of service. If you were a, an organization on campus that received any kind of funding, um, student government funding, you had to allow your membership um, to participate in a voluntary day of service. And Cedarview was put on the options. Um, and we had in 2016 and 2017, over a hundred students from each. This is a group of fraternity brothers and sorority sisters who were working really, really hard that day. They would spend six to seven hours in the cemetery basically doing whatever we wanted. And they were very tired. And at the end of the day, um, all we did is give them pizza. Um, but they were very happy. And it's an example of not only bringing the local community in, but by bringing students also into the community to help out on such a great project. This is just a quick list. Um, we had a tremendous amount of community support. Yes, we had folks that were coming into the cemetery and, you know, bringing their rakes and hauling out trees. And then we had lots of community um, businesses that were providing pizza and water um, and Lowe's, Home Depot, Mammoth Building Supply, giving us gloves and small hand tools to be able to do the work that we needed to do to clean the cemetery. In the interest of time, I'm going to speed up a little bit more. Um, again, you know, I'm a, I'm a social worker. That's what I teach at Mammoth. And so one of the things that we're always doing in social work is to bring pieces of the community together. Um, this is a picture of now May Edwards down here in the left-hand corner, providing a lecture to the master's level school of social work students. Um, as, a, as a member of the cemetery, the community as in a former African-American genealogical society president. And so we had the opportunity to bring her in where she gave some details of her own family, of a little bit of the cemetery and her actions over the years to preserve the history. In addition to cleaning and preserving the cemetery, we began to do some events to get the word out, to mark the history, um, to just show the importance and be respectful. So the very first thing we had, and you can see the cemetery is not quite clear at this point, but it was clear enough to walk around. And we had a tribute to the Civil War veterans the first Veterans Day that per people can walk through. It was November 8th of 2015. And we had reenactors come. We had a lovely little ceremony um, attended by quite a few people. We have had um, 
thank you events. This one was held at St. Leo's in their parish center. They allowed us space where we could thank all of the members of the community, including some of the master students that not only did some of the work, but also did a lot of the research around the cemetery. Um, we got a lot of our information this way. This is also, again, May Edwards, different members of our now board, different members. Here's Rob again. Um, this is the Dean of the School of Social Work. This is our past Associate Provost at Monmouth. Um, so many, many members just coming together to thank the amount of effort and the groups who put so much time into the cemetery. For the last two years, again, you can see how clear the cemetery is at this point. We've been able to hold a Memorial Day Remembrance, so 2021, 2022. Here's um, Rick up here different members of groups. This is our president down here again, John Smack, um, and a small ceremony to um, remember those in the cemetery. Um, and I don't know if you can tell, but back here, we also had some reenactors that day as well. So this is the way the cemetery looks today. Um, maybe not today because of the fall leaves, but in general, the cemetery is very, very clear. You can um, walk easily. You can access it through the stairs, walk up. It is very large as both Rick and Rob discussed. So it's quite deep when you walk in from the stairs, you can walk a ways back, um, but it's clear and it's able to be accessed by all. Here's a cleanup down here. Um, which of course we have to periodically do as the leaves fall. We are hope, hopefully moving towards permanent restoration. So as Rob mentioned, we form Friends of the Cedar View Cemetery that happened in 2021. Um, we're looking for efforts of caretaking, research, connecting, uh, restoration and preservation so it never gets back to what we walked into in 2015. Uh, we have a website that we invite everyone to visit. Um, we are doing fundraising. Uh, we consistently have ongoing cleanup efforts. And if anyone would like to contact me for either of those things or further information, we invite you to do that at any time. I'm going to open it up for questions. There's a smidgen of time left. Let's see. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? You did a beautiful job, guys. Uh, I mean, that was, first of all, it was a fantastic presentation, but what a beautiful job you did on that cemetery. Thank you. Um, so Frank is asking, was the area metal detected? It has not been metal detected. Mm -hmm. And someone is asking if you had to create a cemetery association under the state of New Jersey. Um, not to my knowledge, what we have done is we had to basically sign up as caretakers of the cemetery with Middletown. So we've done that as volunteers. And then the 501c3 was created. Mm -hmm. And how do you maintain it? The cemetery? Yeah, itself. like cutting the grass and all that? Well, lots of cleanups, lots of people volunteering their time. Um, we can get in there now with lawnmowers and weed whackers, which were difficult in the beginning. Um, so it, it takes a lot of effort and Middletown has been gracious as we pull leaves and pull brush and branches to collect it promptly and get it out of the walkway. That's great. Um, are there, are you, are people still being buried there? Are there plots available? Is it closed? Rob? Uh, we don't know which plots are available for burial. Uh, but as far as we know, it's a, it's an inactive cemetery. Okay. Because you know one of the, one of the problems is is you have to find the original deed of who owns what, right. and we haven't done all that discovery yet. We know some of them, obviously the Reeds. We know they have a deed, but most of the lots uh, we don't have deeds for. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. Okay. So closed for business, we'll say. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? I know Rick um, had a little technical difficulty, so he dropped off and I don't think we can hear him, but um, yeah, if anybody has any more comments or you want to ask uh, Rick a question, you could email him um, or you can email me and I'll forward it to him and then he can get back to you. All right. So thank you so much for being here tonight and telling us about Cedar View Cemetery. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody.